do I need to do the snap for you? I love you. Love you. Okay, dokes. Um, it's good to be doing videos again. Uh, when I initially started this, I thought, yes, I'll get all 12 poems done in a couple of weekends. <laughs> that didn't turn out the way I intended. But it's good to be sitting down to actually be doing a video. So today's video is First Day After the War by Mazizi Kuneni. I'm going to do a little background on Mazizi Kuneni. I'm going to speak a little bit about some ideas about form, then a bit about themes and go into analysis. After the analysis, I'd like to talk about some of the problem analyses that I've seen. And I'd also like to suggest an interpretation of, of the first part of the poem that I think is an important interpretation to keep in mind. So Muzizi Kuneni, South African poet, born in 1930 in Durban, he got his master's in arts at the University of Natal in the 50s. In the 60s, he went to the UK. He became a representative for the ANC there. In 1966, his writing was banned. So I think he was someone who was very familiar with what it meant to be silenced on that level. And my interpretation of this poem is that in many respects, he is finding ways to speak despite that silencing. And I'll come back to that idea. I'll come back to that idea in the alternative reading. In the 70s, in 73, he went to the University of California, Los Angeles. He got a doctorate and he ended up lecturing there as a professor of African literature. In 92, he came back home and he taught at the University of KwaZulu Natal and taught there for many years. And unfortunately, he passed away in 2006. I think the important thing to think about with regards to this poem and with regards to Kaneni's writing in general is that he writes from two quite clear perspectives. The first is the perspective of a Zulu person. He's very clearly reclaiming that identity. And I think it's no mistake that his writing came to fruition in the 60s and 70s and 80s at the same time as black consciousness came to fruition, both in South Africa and in America. I think that's a massive influence on his writing, this reclaiming of black identity, this celebration of black identity, especially in apartheid South Africa where black identity was denigrated to such an extent. I think he's also, apart from writing from a Zulu perspective and writing with Zulu ancestry, Zulu culture, Zulu cosmology in mind, I think he's also writing from a pan-Africanist point of view. And that is also very clear in this poem, and we'll see that when we come to it. So there is within his writing a sense of a specific culture, a sense of a specific heritage, and there's also a sense of a greater culture and a greater heritage and a greater connection. His wife, Matobo, in an interview, said of his writing, turn the right way, said of his writing, that he never wrote in English, so all his work had to be translated from Isizulu. He used to say he could not think or be angry in English and needed his ancestors to guide him as he wrote, so whatever he wrote could only be authentic in his mother tongue. And then a quote from Kuneni himself, I did not choose to write in Zulu. I did not have to make a decision. As you say in my tradition, we are actually inhabited by the spirits on your shoulders and they tell you what to do, what to say. And those spirits very much link him, I think, to the tradition of Zulu poetry, of Izimbongis, of praise poet, of oral poet. And when you read the poem, particularly as a whole, you get a sense of those building rhythms, that praise poems is that building of rhythm, that wonderful richness. And his poem has something similar to it in the sound and even in the imagery, the way in which the imagery expands out. 
I can't think of anything else that I need to say about that. Yes, I almost forgot. Um, part of his reclaiming of that of of his Zulu culture, his heritage, the Zulu cosmology, and one of the things that he's most famous for, in 1979, he wrote Emperor Shaka the Great, a Zulu epic, and in this he he reclaims the figure of Shaka Zulu. Especially during apartheid, Shaka Zulu was denigrated as this evil man who killed so many white people. But he writes from another perspective, and he wrote from another perspective at a time when that perspective was not encouraged or welcomed or, or where space was made for it locally in South Africa. So he reclaimed that identity, that strength, that pride within the Zulu history and the Zulu culture by writing that poem. And so much of this poem has so many of those elements in you know, the sense of this poem too was written in Isi Zulu and then translated into English. This poem too connects to the specific ideas that he drew from as a Zulu, Zulu person and this poem too celebrates a sense of pan-Africanism. With regards to the form of the poem, I've seen quite a bit that suggests that this sort of in the teacher networks that this is a lyrical poem and a lyrical poem is first person and it's generally exploring emotions and feelings i'm not too sure about that i'm not too sure that i agree that this is simply a lyrical poem and the reason why i don't agree is because it's written in the first person plural it's not written in the first person singular and I don't think that was an idle choice. I don't think that was a random decision. I think it was a very calculated, very thought-through choice on the part of Kuneni. When he writes from the we, he writes from the perspective of the Zulu culture. He writes from the perspective of black South Africans during apartheid. He writes from the perspective of a pan-Africanist view that sees or saw at that time a move towards the African Renaissance. So this, this individualistic sort of exploration of emotions is not what's happening here. There's something else happening here. And I think it's more attuned or more akin to the, the, the rhythms and the build-up of oral poetry and praise poetry. In terms of themes, a very basic theme is celebration celebration of democracy, celebration of freedom, celebration of heritage and of culture, celebration of a connection to ancestors, and also celebration of winning the war. And I don't think we should lose sight of that. I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that part of this, there's an undercurrent of, of strength, of power, of saying, we fought the war, we won the war. And I'm going to come back to that idea when I look at some of the troubling interpretations of this poem that I've seen. With regards to the interpretation itself, with regards to the analysis itself, I think we do this poem a disservice when we think of it as simple. And I've heard it spoken about of spoken about as simple. Certainly on the surface, it seems like a very simple poem. The language is simple. It's not very long. You know, it's, it's saying, yay, we're free. It's awesome. But there's so much more to it than that. And I think we need to be wary of seeing this poem as easy or as simple. I think we undercut the power of this poem when we do that. So, the first day after the war, that title in and of itself, really important, it suggests that there has been a war. And again, I'm going to come back to that later on. Directly after the war is our first line of the poem. We heard the songs of a wedding party. What's interesting about that line, it starts just with sound. There's no other descriptor given in that line. So. The introduction into the world of the poem, it's very small, it's, it's just sound, it's a wedding party. So what does a wedding party symbolize? A wedding 
symbolizes celebration, union, new birth, new opportunity. It celebrates, it symbolizes happiness. And those are really important ideas on the first day after the war. A sense that the culture can continue, the culture can grow, because that's what weddings are about as well, the continuation, the new generation, the next generation. So we go from this idea of just having heard, we heard the so songs of a wedding party, we saw a soft light, from sound to sight, and again what we're introduced to there is limited, it's just, it's just the soft light. And why soft light? Well, I think soft light is associated with ideas of dawn, a new day, a new beginning. And this is, again, the first day after the war. So it's a new beginning after the war. And that soft light was coiling around the young blades of grass. In my alternative interpretation, I'll spend a bit of time on that line, particularly on the connotation of coiling and blades. For now, what I want to look at is the fact that those are young blades of grass. So again, the idea of, of new, of things growing, of things changing, um, the idea of grass as well, this is in, within the natural world that this is taking place. And the first day after the war, we, we hear these sounds of celebration, we see soft light, and we see young grass, we hesitated. Why, why the hesitancy? Because we're not sure. We're not sure. Is this real? Are we sure about this? Is, is this really the first day after the war? Then we saw her footprints. The word then, I think, is really important because it suggests that there's now an end to the hesitation. They've stopped hesitating because they've seen her footprints. And I have seen quite a few interpretations that the woman in the poem is South Africa personified, the new South Africa personified. So when we saw her footprints, then we were no longer worried. And what do her footprints signify? What does that symbolize? Well, footprints symbolize that there's been a person, that there's been movement across the land, that there has been a track left on the land. And when we think about land and landscape within the, con within the confines of apartheid South Africa, I think there's a richer meaning to be taken from that image. I think, and I, and I think it runs through the poem as well, is that there's a reclaiming of space within this poem. We start from the minute, we start from the tiny, the sound, the sight of these limited things, the grass, the footprint. And from there, the poem builds out and builds out. And it reclaims that space. It reclaims that landscape, which the apartheid government had so violently and so grossly claimed for itself. And there's this very powerful reclamation of land within the poem. It's very powerful spreading through the poem into the landscape. And I think one of the things that is most beautiful for me about this poem is that that reclamation doesn't just stay within the confines of the landscape. It goes into the infinite. It goes into the spiritual. It connects with the ancestors at the end of the poem. Then we saw her footprints. Her face emerged. Again, another detail that's coming to the fore. Then her eyes of freedom. So seeing her, seeing her response, then we believe this is, this is freedom, this is potentially real. And that exclamation mark tells us that it's the freedom that's so important. She woke us up with a smile saying, line six, she woke us up with a smile saying, that line is one of the lines in this poem that I think is overlooked. When we see this as a simple poem, we overlook the fact that there's a contradiction in that line. Haven't they been awake up until now? Haven't they been hearing and seeing and seeing the footprints and seeing the grass? So why in line six is she waking them up? Clearly it's not a literal waking that he's referring to. It's a figurative waking. 
at this point, seeing these details, seeing the intimation of freedom, wakes the we of the poem up. They begin to really, from this point on, move out into the landscape, claim that landscape. She woke us up with a smile saying, what day is this that comes so suddenly? And if South Africa is the she in the poem personified, then it's as if South Africa didn't quite know what's going on. Yes, she has these eyes of freedom, but she's like, what day is this? What's going on? What's happening? And perhaps we can interpret that as the sort of more civilian populace of the country at the time, the people who were not fighting for freedom, the people who were not part of the war. We said it is the first day after the war. A repetition of the idea that this is not simply this wonderful Rainbow Nation moment, because the story of our Rainbow Nation, the story of democracy within South Africa, is one in which, for the most part, we managed to avoid a massive civil war. I know some people would say that there was civil war in South Africa. I think I would tend towards categorizing that as civil unrest. I think we avoided a lot of additional bloodshed. I think we avoided a lot, a lot of hardship. There was bloodshed, there was hardship, there was murder, there was horrifying acts. There were horrifying acts. But it wasn't a full scale as much as one can quantify this civil war. And in that respect, we were lucky. But our poem seems to suggest that that is what we came out of, that it wasn't what we actually experienced. Then without re waiting, we ran into the open space. Put that line again within apartheid South Africa. We ran into the open space. Space was contested. Space and land were, were things that were taken from one group and held in the confines of another group. And here we have Kune, in Kuneni's poem, this idea that the people have run back into this space and claimed it as their own, have taken ownership of it as their own. There's something immensely powerful within that. And the, the people that he's describing are immensely powerful. We ran back, we claimed the space. It is ours. Ululating to the mountains and the pathways. So we run into the open space and hear the, the sound in, in the beginning was a wedding party and ululation is obviously associated with wedding and celebration. But here the sound spreads into the landscape. It's not just the, the we right at the beginning who heard it. The ululation spreads around, it is heard, it, it moves into that open space. And what does the ululation do? It calls people from all the circles of the earth. The image of circles of the earth, again, is seemingly so simple. But if we stop and we f give the poem its due regard, then we have to look at that image a little bit closely. The idiom, the English idiom, is all corners of the earth. And Kuneni, who is proficient in Isizulu and English, has chosen instead to say circles of the earth. Why circles? Why not all corners of the earth? What's the difference in, in symbolism between those two ideas? Well, corners suggest sides or it suggests sharpness, whereas a circle suggests something softer, more peaceful, more perhaps democratic, more together. There's a reason why in King Arthur's tales it was the, the Arthur's round table because no one was above anyone else. And so this idea of circles suggests the togetherness of these different people, suggests that there is no one who's above or below anyone else and that the people who moved into the space, who were called into the space, are all on equal footing. We shook up the old man demanding a festival. Now, the, if you shake something up, you're waking it up, you're stirring it, you're rousing it to action. And why the old man? Well, the old man could be 
a representation representation of the older generation who were not so interested perhaps in taking the fight to the apartheid government. And so we went to those people, to the old people, and we demanded a festival. It's an interesting idea, this idea of demanding, not asking, demanding. Within that, within demanding a festival, we asked for all the first fruits of the season. What are first fruits? Well, it's a tradition that goes back centuries to biblical times, and at the beginning of the harvest, the first harvest of spring or summer, these were the first fruits that were harvested after autumn and winter where there, were no, there was no fruit because they hadn't grown yet. Now we get to summer and spring, spring and summer, and suddenly the, there's fruit, there's sweetness, there's richness, there's the luxury of fruit. And the first fruits were often given up as offerings either to religious bodies so maybe to the temple or to the gods or to the priests or to political bodies because very often those two things overlap so for millennia we have the, this idea of first fruits being an offering something that is given from someone of a lower status to someone of a higher status what is the we in the poem doing they are not taking the first fruits and giving them an offering to anyone else. They are asking for the first fruits to be given to them. And so what does that mean in terms of, of power? It's a reclamation of a position of power. It's a reclaiming and saying, we deserve this. We deserve, put it in the context of apartheid South Africa, we deserve the fruit, the labor of this country. It is ours. It does not, it should not be given to a political or religious power, which in apartheid would have been the apartheid government. It's an incredibly powerful statement. And I think that if we see it simply as, yay, we're celebrating democracy, it's all Heishu, wow, rainbow nation, we're not seeing that reclamation of power. We're not seeing the, the positioning that Kuneni is making within this poem of positioning Zulu people, black South African people, African people within that position of power. We held hands with a stranger, connection, a moving outward. And, and obviously the holding hands suggests camaraderie, suggests a sort of um, brother or sisterhood of humanity we shouted across the waterfalls and again if we don't just think of that as a simple image but we say why a waterfall why not a stream why not a river why a waterfall and think of what it means to shout across a waterfall think of what it means that the human voice travels that far especially because the human voice has gently recurred throughout the poem, the sound of the wedding songs, the ululation, and as the poem has moved out in scope, so the sound has become bigger, has become bolder, the, 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 the voice that is heard is so much more powerful. To shout across a waterfall, a waterfall suggests this power of the water, suggests the movement, suggests the sound. To shout across that and be heard suggests the power of the person shouting. People came from all lands. It was the first day of peace. That's a wonderful image. It's a wonderful image that they've come to celebrate. We saw our ancestors traveling tall on the horizon. So we've gone from this very little blades of grass to broader mountains, waterfalls, and then into an, an infinite. We've gone into the world of the spirit, the world of the ancestors. This reclamation of the land has reconnected the we, the people within the poem, with their heritage, with their ancestors, with their base of spiritual power. The ancestors, capital A, 
we get the sense of respect, we get the sense of their power traveling tall. Again, powerfulness, but also pride, the sense that the viewers, the we in the poem, take a, a massive measure of pride in these ancestors. And where are the ancestors? The ancestors are traveling on the horizon. So they're separate from the world of the living. But the fact that they are on the horizon and the fact that this poem has slowly moved out into the landscape around it to the point of the horizon suggests that all of this land that was not belonging to the Isizulu people or the Isikosa people or the South African people, the indigenous people, has now come back under their guardianship to the point of the horizon. The horizon line is as far as you can see. It's a point beyond which you cannot see. So all of that massive space is now under the protection and guardianship of the, the ancestors. All of that massive space has been reclaimed by the original the indigenous people of the country after apartheid. This isn't a simple poem. I think if we see it as a simple poem, we do it in injustice. So part of the analyses that I've, I've had some problems with is that there are a number of blog sites and websites that seem to think that the poem was published in the 90s or in the 2000s. They seem to think that it is a poem which deals with the historical fact that we almost went to war, but we missed it, and yay, look, we can celebrate. They seem to think also that the old man in the poem is Nelson Mandela. This is really problematic because it was published in 1982. It was published during an incredibly violent, tumultuous time in the country. The ANC had been banned, a number of uh, organizations had been banned and silenced. Um, in 1973, there were the massive Durban riot, uh, wage strikes and riots. In 1976, the Soweto uprising, where a peaceful protest was met with bloody violence by the police force. In 1985, post the publishing of the poem, State of Emergency, massive censorship during all of this time. We've got a poet who was banned, so his work couldn't have been spread, or was, was difficult to spread in the country. The poem wasn't written with the knowledge that we would avoid civil war. So when Kuneni writes First Day After the War, and he's writing it in 1982, part of what he's saying in that space at that time, part of what he's doing is saying, we are prepared to go to war. We are prepared to make this violent. And he's I think part of the reason maybe why he's circumspect in saying it, why it's hinted at within the title, The First Day After the War, is because he was banned, because there was censorship. And for him to have outright said, we will go to war with the apartheid government, probably would have meant more of a clampdown on his writing or less of it getting into the country. That's supposition on my part, but I think it's logical supposition. To me, at least, it makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's not a poem that's just Rainbow Nation. It's not a poem that's, yay, we missed all the violence. It's a poem that says to the reader, in 1982, when it's published, there will be violence. It suggests that violence. It suggests that the war is a fact, that it happened. And then there will be peace. And there will be peace when there is a reclaiming of land, when there is a reclaiming of space. To assume that this is a simple poem, to forget about when this poem was published, obscures that reading. And I think that reading, that knowledge is incredibly important to our understanding of the poem. So as to the somewhat alternative interpretation that I have, um, I sent a few questions to a couple of uh, universities, to a couple of prof couple of but ten. <laughs> Um, professors asking a few questions about my interpretation to see whether what I was thinking was reasonable. 
Um, I got a few replies back saying yes, they thought it was reasonable. So I'm going to read the questions that I posed and then I'm going to read one or two, one reply and just discuss that a little bit more as well. So the question that I posed, I said, with reference to young blade of grass, within Zulu culture, would the young blades of grass be understood to be a reference to young Zulu warriors? To me, this interpretation would make sense, as the word coiling has negative connotations. It suggests a snake coiling, and thus that the peace might be duplicitous. So initially in the poem, the, the, the we would be wary, is this peace real? Have we made it to this point? So as looking at the word coiling, it has negative connotations. It suggests a snake coiling, and thus that the peace might be duplicitous. This would then tie in with the hesitation of the speakers when first hearing the sounds of celebration. Also, with respect to the image of young blades of grass, would the shape of the blades of grass be symbolic of the shape of the assegai? And would the image of warriors as blades of grass be suggestive of the vast number of Zulu warriors? And I first bounced this idea off um, Mrs. Sonia, who is our Isi Kosa teacher, she said, yeah, it sounds pretty plausible to me. And I thought, let me just check a um, little bit further. I want to get a few more voices in support. And so one of the professors who responded is Isabel Hofmeyer from Witz, and she said, interpretation sounds solid to her. And then I also got a reply from Professor Mbungeni Malaba at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and I'm going to read his response. He says, I think your inference that young blades of grass could represent young warriors is probably correct. Blades suggest something sharp and dangerous, like the assegai, and the large size of the Zulu army is akin to grass swaying in the fields. Coiling has connotations of danger, and snakes are associated with royalty in Nguni myths. And I really liked what he had to add about snakes being associated with royalty because it suggests it suggests in essence the power of the snake. It suggests that if this isn't right, then there will be a response from the snake. So why am I offering this alternative reading? Why, why am I keeping it separate and why am I only bringing it in at the end? Well, I'm bringing it in at the end because I still don't feel as if I have 100% enough confirmation of this viewpoint. And I know that matric markers are often warned and matric teachers are often warned, tell your kids not to go to dodgy websites where they talk crap. So I don't want to be the crap talker, I don't want to be the one who's spouting off some random idea. But I also think that the interpretation is important to share because within this notion of looking at this poem as, as one which elides, covers, Zulu power, I think it's important to step back from that, to put the poem in its context, and to also see within that that it, the poem is not a simple accounting of we went from apartheid into peace, and you can only think that if you think the poem was published post-92. The poem suggests the power of the Zulu people. And if we read the blades of grass as this multitudinous Sulu army, we get a sense of their power, we get a sense of their number, and we get a sense of the threat that Kuneni is showing within his writing. He's not playing nice. He's not suggesting let's all hold hands and be friends. That opening suggests that if necessary, there will be a war, it will be bloody, it will be violent, and then yes, he would love to see peace, and the bulk of the poem is spent on that peace. But don't forget about the opening. Don't forget that this is the first day after the war, and that the war is what brings about the peace. And there's, this, there's that very powerful reclaiming of Zulu power, said power so many times, very annoying, within those opening lines.
few quotes that I want to read in closing and then I hope I haven't spoken too much smack because I'm tired and I want this recording to work and I don't want to have to redo it. Um, so let me read these in closing and I will have put up links to the various sources that I used. And this, this feeds into why I think the alternative reading that I've offered is important. Mazizi Kuneni's epic poems, such as Emperor Shaka the Great and Anthem of the Decades, functioned as works of corrective history that not only sought to reground the historical legacy of the Zulu and therefore the African, but were also an expression of the African as cosmological being. I'm skipping a little bit in the quote. It seems to me that Mazizi Kuneni's unsurpassed poetic act was a desperate and dramatic attempt to resurrect African cosmology in the modern world. His writings are vital in the myth-making and historicization necessary to renew severed spirits. So I hope you enjoyed the analysis. If you have questions, please pose them. One day, one day, I will answer them. I don't know exactly when that one day is. Um, but it will happen. It will come. I will answer. Um, and I'm hoping that the next video will be the Jeremy Cronin poem. Because I'm quite fond of that poem as well. <laughs>